And welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted, episode 805. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is June 6th, 2023. All right, thank you for joining us for another episode of Anglican Unscripted. How can two busy people ever sit down once or twice a week and make a show? I I don't know. George, you don't know. It just happens. And we try for Tuesdays and Thursdays. And uh, this is going to be an abbreviated show because we're busy people. But we got six great stories. George, how are you doing this week? Well, my uh, I, I've been snake bit, as they say, ever since I got back from my exorcism course in Rome, where things just... If uh, if I have a choice, if things are either going to be good or bad, they're going to be bad. Well, that that streak's continuing. I spent yesterday afternoon several hours in court at the county courthouse. One of our parishioners is serving a five-year sentence for theft. They stole eight hundred dollars, and were sentenced to five years in prison. And what the uh, there was the appeal. She's been in for about three and a half years now. And the appeal was that at the time of her sentencing, her attorney did not submit a uh, mitigation memo, which uh, was prepared by a forensic psychiatrist who said that she suffers from bipolar disorder and was self-medicating with pot. But once she got arrested and then she was Baker acted, which is take forcibly in, in sent to a hospital and is now being treated. And since her treatment, She's remorseful, she's made restitution, and she's been a model prisoner with no disciplinary marks in three and a half years. The the appeal was that that piece of paper should have been given to the judge when he made his sentence decision. And I witnessed the spectacle of the girl's attorney essentially lying to the court. The attorney who screwed up the first time saying, Oh, well, I told the judge this in chambers. Oh, well, I told her, her parents, this and this and that. And I told her supporters, I told Father Conger that his testimony on her change since she became a Christian, since she started having medical treatment, would have no effect. Well, a woman was lying. And I think she did so to cover her ass, cover CYA, not to be called incompetent. And the prosecutor couldn't care because the prosecutor just wants to... Uh, be seen tough on crime rather than be just so i just have a, i woke up this morning very angry at the world because of the injustices of our dysfunctional court system where you know some places in the united states you can burn down the federal building if you're in portland and you're you know no no problem you go to washington dc and you uh stand outside the Capitol while others are breaking in, you get three year prison sentence for sedition. Um, you, uh, you stick up a liquor store and shoot five people in New York City, you're let out in Florida, you steal $800, you get a five year sentence. And the prosecutor said, well, the judge could have given up to 30 years for stealing $800. We just have a broken judicial system. Oh, that- I- yeah, absolutely. And you and I have watched this for decades where uh, justice is not uh, delivered uh, fairly, not just mm-hmm. in our country, but around the world. Uh, there's a lot of hypocrisy in, in justice. And I was raised to believe that justice is blind, that uh, it's this there to weigh the evidence. And, nah, you know, to a certain extent, yeah, but to a large extent, uh, the problem is uh, geographic location where you live if florida is tough on crime okay uh and so is texas and and many other uh uh, southeastern states uh northeast is loose on crime california doesn't prosecute crime anymore you got to do some really nasty stuff to even make it to the prosecutor's office to make it to his desk there's probably three or four missing bodies somewhere well, you yeah. are right in that it is consistent in some areas. Mm-hmm. Consistent uh, in the sense that if you steal eight hundred bucks, you'll get five years in Florida. If you steal, uh, if you hold up a liquor store, you're going to get forty-five years to mm-hmm. life. I mean, yeah. it's it's not that there are certain crimes that are in Florida are not punished. They just punish everything with a very heavy hand. 
Um, but it, to me, it's just the mendacity and the evil of humanity, of just Satan. You know, the, what the, the lawyer was incompetent the first time around, and she, and she, in my opinion, tried to smooth things over because she still has to work in this county. She still has to work with the judge and the prosecutor. It's a small southern county. And so she basically sacrifices her client testifying against her own client i don't even i didn't i didn't even see i grew up kevin watching dragnet and adam 12 <laughs> and the fbi and i had this image of law enforcement perry and mason. the judiciary sure. perry yeah. mason yeah. you know hamilton burger and perry mason was honest he wanted justice not so much a conviction we don't have that degree of integrity oh no uh, i i don't know if you remember the name michael skakel he was a yes, cousin yes. to the Kennedys, and uh, he's famous for being accused of killing a childhood friend with a, a, a golf club. Mm -hmm. And uh, I attended his uh, appeal after he was convicted of murder. That's uh, right. You did court TV for it. You I were the court, court TV, TV for cameraman. And, and um, about day two into the testimony, uh, I was convinced by the the testimony to hear that Michael Skakel was certainly not, uh, there, there was no evidence for his guilt and that the prosecutor mm -hmm. had gone way over by paying uh, a firm of $5,000 or something like that to produce a video and soundtrack and, and PowerPoint presentation that just wowed the jury uh, into convincing them that Michael Skakel was, was guilty. And he went to jail uh, for... A couple of years, he came up on appeal, and they had this judge there. And you know, at, at a certain point, this judge is like, "But where's the evidence?" You know, you had this great multimedia presentation. You wowed the jury, but where is the evidence that Michael Skakel is guilty? And the prosecutor, you, know, you don't need evidence to find somebody guilty anymore. <laughs> like he didn't say that, <laughs> but you're just like, "Holy cow!" So, yeah, George, I, you and I both agree that the judicial is uh, completely broken. There is a reason uh, the Apostle Paul says, don't seek justice in court. You're not going to find it. it, it mm -hmm. is, it's broken to the core. There are good outcomes, bad outcomes, but there are certainly evil outcomes. George, let's move. Uh, if people, I'm moving from, I'm in uh, Illinois right now. We're going to Iowa uh, today after we uh, finish recording the show. So Sasquatch is still moving around the country. Uh, George is still steaming in, in humid uh, Florida. But the news continues. I like it here, Kevin. I like it. <laughs> this is my time of year. I like it. Here to go curly, but it would curl my hair. Uh, let's look here. This is up at 805 show notes. Squirrels are running rampant. A, a fun story to start off, George. I think this is the well, in England. Some members of the House of of the House of Bishops are uh, de facto members of the House of Lords, the upper mm -hmm. chamber of Parliament, and they are members of the government in every way that a member of Parliament or an active member of the House of Lords is equivalent to representatives or senators in the United States, sort of. Well, the Bishop of St Albans led a debate on squirrel menace facing England where he talked about the invasion of American squirrels gray squirrel eastern gray squirrels are displacing the native red squirrels and this is a crisis that Britain must face now it's sort of funny it's sort of cute but the reason why I picked that out is that I think that's the level of uh, involvement the, the bishop should be in they shouldn't have Justin Welby attacking the government on immigration and being real bona fide politicians pushing political agendas. If I were English, I would be happy that my bishop is going hard on squirrels. Uh, I just, I just, just strikes me as just a wonderful story. The squirrel menace facing. And what is because you and I have to report on the best of the episcopacy and the worst of the episcopacy. You know, and what happens here in uh, 2023. And we've we've come across some really bad stories that we as journalists have had to report. And it's fine. To, it's fun to find. It's not a fluff story, but, you know, it, it's way off the beaten track of what we normally have to report on about a bishop, George. 
Well, last week we reported about Martin Warner. I miscalled him. I misnamed him. It's David Warner, but oh, Martin yeah. Warner, Oops, sorry. Bishop, of, Bishop yeah. of Chichester, yeah. uh, basically did a hands-off ignoring the poor, crazy priest, David Renshu, who's sacrificing squirrels and chickens and sheep and satanic rituals and all this and that. And now we have a bishop, unlike Martin Warner, who ignores uh, the plights of little furry creatures. We have a, a bishop in St. Albans who is a champion for British squirrels <laughs> against, the, uh, against the illegal immigration of American squirrels. Mm -hmm. So in this case, foreign squirrels are bad. Foreigners must be extirpated and driven out of England so that the native British can flourish now we're not talking about people we're talking about squirrels sure so yeah that's fine well i just read that uh john Sentamu has resigned from christian aid and uh that's that's cool because there should be some accountability for the actions he did not do yes john Sentamu uh resigned last week as uh, chairman of christian aid which is a major british charity and this is a big deal. It's like being head of the Red Cross or something. It, it's not a, well, I don't know much how much he put into it, but it is a great honor and it did involve responsibilities and a public platform. And Santamu, because of the blowback from the uh, uh, scandal of his inaction over the uh, Matthew Innocent affair, uh, resigned. In the Church Times, there was an exchange of correspondence. Uh, Ian Paul, who is uh, a member of the Archbishop's Counselor, Council uh, in the Church of England, and he's a uh, noted uh, writer. We publish his stuff on Anglican Inc. all the time. He penned a letter saying that Johnson Tamu's uh, actions were just atrocious in this. He's ba basically saying, you know, not my problem, not my fault, you know, don't look at me. And he was being legalistic. Well, in response, you had two bishops write back saying Ian Paul is just being mean to poor Johnson Tamu because all Johnson Tamu did was, you know, follow the letter of the law. So the lesson really hasn't been learned yet that safeguarding is everybody's responsibility, not just somebody's. Yeah. In St. Tamu's case, he didn't supervise Stephen Croft. And because of that, he's been hammered and have to step down. But here's the funny part. Stephen Croft is still Bishop of Oxford. Nothing's happened to him. And in fact, Croft has had the audacity to go preach about safeguarding in the House of Lords. And I, I, don't, I can't guarantee it. I assume and presume that Stephen Croft will there will be no action taken against him for what happened here that the only fall guy uh, is going to be John Santama. Yeah. Can, I, can I do a little uh, sidestep and then we'll step back into the story? Just sure, why not? A, a number of people have written us telling us that did we know that Stephen Croft's son, Andy, is a Church of England priest and has been the guy running Soul Survivor, which has been the recent story of Mike uh, Pilevacci, what, what, what not. And isn't it, should we link the dots? And to me, the answer is no. I mean, I'm not going to, I don't want to blame the son for the sins of the father. I mean, we each have different life paths and careers. And so if, if people are looking for us to do an in-depth trying to tie A to B together, it's not going to come from us. Well, I mean, if there's just no smoking gun either. Yeah. I mean, we try to look for evidence and not just hearsay in our reporting uh, believe it or not we do try to investigate our reporting we don't just sit here in a webcam and go hey let's talk about this uh we have to have something to do it otherwise you end up in court trying to justify what you said something stupid and we don't try to t do stuff stupid so let's take that back to uh, well yeah and if my uh if my kids uh are going to be beaten up for what i think one lives in san francisco one lives in seattle they're going to be big targets for their friends Absolutely. Yeah. All right, let's move on to some more news. Uh, right as I pressed the publish button last Friday for the show, uh, I saw a news story that we published that 
presiding bishop, Michael Curry, uh, was in the hospital uh, receiving medical care, and it sounded pretty concerning, George. Yeah, he had to spend a few days in the hospital for internal bleeding. Michael Curry's had some medical problems over mm -hmm. recent years. He's had, he was treated for prostate cancer, he's got high, hypertension, and he was wound up in the hospital. Uh, he maintains a home in North Carolina, plus his official residence in New York City. And he was hospitalized, and he's had to cancel coming to Orlando this weekend to lay hands on the new bishop, Justin Welby of Central Florida, uh, Justin Holcomb, excuse Holcomb, me. Yeah. That's all right. Of, uh, too many Justins, Kevin. Uh, <laughs> and it was the Feast of Justin Martyr last week, too, so we got all, oh, no. all coming at once. Uh, so so Curry was is is ill, so ill, that he's had to cancel basically the one thing that presiding bishops are supposed to do, which is fly around the country each weekend and make new bishops. Uh, so we're getting, uh, I think, Clifton Daniels or some retired older bishop uh, to, to be the chief consecrator. But Michael Curry's, uh, he retires uh, 2024, but he really has been coasting for physical health reasons. He's not said anything, for instance, about the Uganda anti-gay laws that have exercised so many people. Um, and in the past, that would be red meat. Oh, for okay. uh, for Michael Curry, and he's been quiet about it. Mm -hmm. Well, but you know, so is Justin Welby and uh, Cottrell. They've been no, quiet no. too. Well, but hold on. As an Anglican unscripted viewer, I ask that you pray for presiding Bishop Michael Curry. Uh, we pray for our bishops. We pray for uh, uh, even those who aren't doing jobs that we find stellar. We still pray for them. You know, and. Uh, uh, I, pray, I pray that his health uh, returns, George. Yeah, I'm going to have to miss the consecration of Justin Holcomb. Uh, one of the fellows uh, on Friday dropped out of a heart attack while mowing the church lawn. Oh. Uh, and uh, we're going to have his funeral this coming Saturday, the same time as the consecration, so I won't be there. But we're sending it... We're sending a delegation, deputation, and you know one of the vestry members is going to carry a, a banner and vest for the wear an alb for the procession and everything. Okay, but good. you know, at the end of the day, your pa your pastoral obligations outweigh any uh, ceremonial obligations or life. Anglican unscripted obligations. Uh, for, not all the time, but you sometimes say, "Hey, got an emergency? Got to go to a nursing home? Got to go to the ER? Whatever?" I say, "Fine." Do it. Church before unscripted. Now the audience is about, ooh, I, no, 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 no. We want unscripted before church. No, it doesn't work that way. This would be a failure of a show if we uh, didn't uh, have our priorities set straight. Let's talk about Utah. Now, Utah, if you don't know, is where the Mormon church is headquartered, Salt Lake City. Um, and it, if, if you meet people from Utah and the Salt Lake City area, you would know them for their religiosity, their spiritual, you know, that a lot of people attend churches, not just the Mormon church, now, but now yeah. shouldn't Kevin, you say that, uh, you do have a, uh, you must reveal an interest in this story. Okay. I, uh, I do have a bias in the story, uh, because I am a direct descendant from Brigham Young. He is a, you know, four or five generations up, you know, and uh, I am a descendant of his, and he regrets that every day. So, but that, there's there's oh. my thing. So, uh, we have read in the news. I saw this on uh, Newsmax and CNN that a school district has decided to ban the Bible from religious Utah. <laughs> Yeah, a uh, suburban Salt Lake City school district. Uh, Utah has a law that allows parents to petition to have uh, objectionable materials removed from school libraries. Mm -hmm. And this was done to sort of uh, counter the uh, American Library Association and their left-wing agenda. So Heather has two mommies, and uh, some of the stories we read about... Uh, uh, sex manuals and whatnot being introduced into school libraries for students to read. Well, a parent in this conservative Salt Lake City suburb filed a petition with the school board saying the Bible has is inappropriate for elementary 
at school students because it has accounts of incest, has accounts of rape, it has accounts of murder and massacre. You read through some of the Old Testament things. Song of Solomon. Uh, yeah, and, and you know, Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul, when he talks about that, uh, uh, those who, uh, all the different types of people who will not go into the kingdom of heaven, uh, mm -hmm. promiscuous homosexuality, fornicators, homosexual, fornicators <laughs> alcoholics, uh, idolaters. <laughs> well, what if some poor little child wandered into the library, this uh, woman said, and her mother was an alcoholic. Uh, fornicating, blah, 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 and she'd find out her mommy isn't going to go to heaven. And so the school district uh, has banned the Bible from the library of the... Uh... Now, this follows about 40, 50 years ago. They started taking the Bible out of biblical lessons, out of the curriculum, mm -hmm. and taking prayer out of school. Sure. So this is just a natural step, and it's coming from left-wing activists. And part of the reason why this story has legs is that it, it occurred in all places, Utah. It's like occurring in Mississippi or Alabama or in Citrus County, Florida. It's just, you know, uh, unheard of because those are very religious places. Um, but, you know, Kevin, if you really think about it, I agree with the parent because I agree that the Bible is dangerous. It's not a storybook. It's a book that changes your life. The Bible is dangerous. No, I, I, if this person is afraid of what's in the Bible, you should be. Absolutely, because uh, it, it, it's dangerous. Uh, many precepts, the most dangerous thing in the world is it's something that be, uh, is life-changing, society-changing, world-changing, um, and we have the history of the last uh, 2,000 years to show what Scripture can do in changing the world. We have also the example of the last 200 years of what happens when there's no Scripture. So, Yeah, I mean, and the Bible is quite clear. You know, in the Hebrews it says, uh, I think it's, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. So, I mean, the Bible doesn't make any make any bones or pull any punches. It is the most influential text ever written uh, in America on the frontier uh, up until the beginning, mid nineteenth century, mid twentieth century. The Bible was the primary book by which people learned to read. If you read, um, people read the Bible in English. And the whole Protestant Reformation was about giving access to the scriptures to the people, hmm. not just to the priest. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly finished unto all good works. <gasps> so you'd be afraid. And, 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 but you know, one of the things we have is the, the Bible doesn't sugarcoat the human experience. It tells the truth. Unlike many Episcopal churches, which try to sort of sugarcoat and sweet things, and or like these guys, uh, oh, what's that, Joel Osteen type, where the Bible is just about every day and in every way, it's going to be your best day ever. Smiles and giggles, yeah. The Bible, yeah. if you read it, is not like that. And so... I guess on one level, this parent is correct. This is dangerous. This is dynamite. It will change the world if you allow it. And for those in power, they don't want it to happen. They want to remain in power and have people ignorant and uh, kept far from the saving words of Christ. All right. Final story. I've always thought, you know, towards the end of the year, Georgia had, should have an award show. You mm -hmm. know, kind of the Oscars or the uh, what what we call it, uh, uh, you know, some type of award show. You, you hand out a little Emmy to some people who've done something silly, screwy, and it's kind of cool. We have somebody who's nas internationally recognized now as a left winger by mm -hmm. a left winger magazine, and uh, I thought that's kind of cute that uh, we have somebody who we could uh, legitimately send an award to now, George. 
Yes, we, we had somebody uh, complain that we were mean to AOC last week. And of course, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, we may have disagreed with her, her viewpoints, but we've never attacked her personally. Oh. Uh, they, of course, I think were referring to what they call AOC, the Archbishop of Canterbury. And we've had our fair share of meeting up Justin Welby, um, part of our job. Well, the well, new it's states- It's not our job to beat him up, it's our job to hold him accountable. I, You're right. Yeah, yeah. Better said. Better said. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but the New Statesman is the sort of flagship magazine of progressive British English uh, life. Uh, think of it as sort of the uh, nation or the New Republic or the Atlantic in the United That's States, right, yeah. a, a left winger magazine. Yeah. It put out an article about the 50 most prominent leftists in Britain. And number 27 is the Archbishop of Canterbury. He is considered more important on the left than Jeremy Corbyn, oh, who was the former leader of the Labour Party. <sighs> so, so, Justin, I'm sorry, man. You are being tagged by the secular liberal press as being a flag standard bearer for the left-wing political elites in Britain. It's not George and Kevin being cranky and mean. Uh, it's just us reporting the reality of life. Unless part of our audience is just new statesman uh, journalist. You know, maybe they just watch us Good. and say, well, this is what we should think of Justin Welby. Uh, no, Justin Welby determines what you think of Justin Welby, and uh, we don't have very much to say about that. Uh, his fruits are right before him. George, this is going to be one of our shorter shows, mostly because I have to, to turn the engine on and drive out of here. But uh, you have yourself There's somebody <laughs> pulling out and back at you just this moment. Before. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <coughs> I'm Kevin Carlson, and I'm George Congan. You've been watching episode 805 of Anglican Unseen.